Hello, everyone. Uh, by my clock here in the state of Iowa in the U.S., it's 3.30 p.m. On the East Coast, it's 4.30 p.m. And I know there's a lot of people coming in from other time zones. So uh, that means for me it's and the rest of us, it's ready to start. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, restorative justice webinar event today being put on by Eastern Mennonite University's Center for Justice and Peace Building. Uh, and our topic today is, does restorative justice need forgiveness? Um, and I will uh, just give a brief introduction for myself and then uh, kind of an overview of how things will flow uh, in this webinar in the next hour and a half. And um, I will also, and then I'll turn things over to Howard and we can get going. Um, as I said, my name is Brian Gum. I'm the Distance Learning Technology Analyst for Eastern Mennonite University. I'm also a graduate of the Center for Justice and Peace Building, uh, and my, my emphasis there was in restorative justice. So Howard Zare was one of my professors, um, and uh, I'm very happy to be helping out in this way. And um, so here's how things are going to work. Um, you will be able to see and hear the panelists, Howard and our and our guest uh, Sujata Baliga will be will be discussing the topic today. And uh, participants will be able to ask questions in the chat window in this uh, in the WebEx software. And the person to send those to is the panelist named Jen Bricker. And we will see Jen later as well, but. Um, Throughout the course of the webinar, if you have any questions that you would like to have addressed during the course of the conversation, the way to do that would be to send a message in the chat box to Jen Bricker. Um, you, if somehow messages also get to me as the host, um, I will then forward those on to Jen. Um, so we'll try our best to catch all questions that are asked and uh, we'll, we'll address as many as we can. And uh, so without further ado, I think I'll turn things over to Howard. And Howard, if you want to get your webcam started, uh, and Sujata, you can probably do the same, uh, but keep yourself on mute when you're ready to go. Howard, you, you can take it from here. Thank you, Brian. And thank you to all of you who are joined us today. We have a nice spread from around the world with us this afternoon. Um, that the, the webinar today is going to focus on a particular case, a case that's gotten a lot of attention here in the United States and around the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it particularly got attention when it got into the New York Times Magazine and then on the Today Show here. We're going, it stirred up a lot of interest but also a lot of controversy. We're going to be looking at this from the point of view of restorative justice practitioners, what we can learn from this and so forth. Our guest today is uh, my friend Sujatha Baliga. The, um, you see a little bit about her here. She is, works for the National Center for Crime and Delinquency, specializing in restorative justice. She began her, or I guess she began her career, I don't know, maybe she did something before this, but she was a battered women's advocate before she went to law school. She had intended to become a prosecutor, and maybe she wanted to nail these guys, as she could say whether that was the case or not. But she ended up really wanting to uh, assist battered women who were being charged with crimes, often in self-defense. Uh, she went on then to become a, a criminal defense attorney, even doing uh, death penalty cases. In the, several years ago, she got a Soros Fellowship uh, to pioneer the use of restorative justice in a conferencing project to divert kids, particularly kids of color at that point, from the system, a project that's still going today. She was also trained in, in severe violence uh, dialogue facilitation. She knows a thing or two about forgiveness, having been on a quite incredible journey, that would be a whole webinar itself, uh, to forgive her father who had sexually abused her. And today when she has time, she leads circles in prison with men who are grappling with these issues as been abusers themselves. So I'm happy to have Sujatha here with us today. Uh, hello, Sujatha. We're Howard. We're um, rather than have an agenda today, we are going to. Uh, there's a list of the kind of topics we're going to cover today. But before we get into that, 
we're going to tell the story as we understand, we've experienced it of the case. And then we'll go from there to try to analyze some of the issues and challenges and the things that have been learned from. So to start, um, in the fall of 2011, I got a call uh, from Julie McBride. And Julie said that her son, Connor, was charged with killing his girlfriend, Anne, and he had planned to kill himself, and instead he had ended up killing his girlfriend. She said that she was interested in restorative justice, and she talked about forgiveness. Now, I have to admit that my response wasn't immediately jumping up and down and be helpful because I get so many inquiries from people on the offender side because restorative justice sounds so good to them. But then I asked Julie, I said, how do you know about restorative justice? She said, well, Kate Gromer, Anne's mother, told me about it. And, and I know we've been talking together and I knew, I knew that this was not an ordinary case. The other challenging thing about it though is she told me this case had not even been pled yet. This was said prior to plea. So this is a, it started out as a potential death penalty case, at least um, a mandatory, a probable life sentence case. And this has not had even been in the courts yet. And so I knew we needed a lawyer and I knew we needed a lawyer who understood restorative justice deeply. And I recommended that they, that uh, Sujatha, and I said I would call her. So I called Sujatha and I told her the circumstances and Sujatha said, no way, how? I, how in the world could we do a case like that? And so, so Jonathan, tell your story from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, Howard actually contacted me in late uh, 2010. Nice to see you, Howard. Um, and uh, you know, it was it wasn't that we 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 knew that restorative justice had been used uh, in uh, a post adjudication context, right? We have so many wonderful examples across the nation of victim offender dialogue uh, in crimes of severe violence, but never at this stage, never so early in the process. Um, that I think was what was um, most sort of just seemed impossible. I mean, it was, we were at this point where um, we hadn't even entered plea negotiation processes. So trying to understand how to apply what we were doing in Oakland, right? This, um, family group conferencing model, what we call restorative community conferencing, uh, where we do do it pre-adjudication, um, pre-plea, pre-even pre charge. We do it pre-charge in Oakland. Um, I didn't understand how we were going to do that here where someone had been charged with first degree murder. Um, and so I was dismissive when I talked with Howard in the beginning and he was, um, I think he was moved uh, by his first conversations with Julie and said, well, just, just talk to her, just talk to her. So I, um, I said, you can give her my number. And, and I think it was within hours that I got the phone call from Julie. I think it was the same day, maybe the next day, um, asking me, you know, to, to consider this. And, and my, my initial reaction was like, Howard's, I mean, she was a wonderful person and I, I wish the best for her son, but I just had no idea how we could possibly help. Right. So, um, so during that conversation, Julie said, you know, um, at, you know, you, you'll just fall in love with the Gromeres. If you just talk to the Gromeres, you're just going to fall in love with them. And I said, I'm not going to cold call these victims. Like that's not how we we operate. It's, and and you know, this isn't a this isn't a good posture. Which and she said, No, no, uh, they, they're the ones who told me about restorative justice. And and so um, I said, Well, if you're really in contact with them, um, go ahead and. Uh, give them my phone number. And I believe it was, again, just a few hours later uh, that my phone rang again, and it was it was Kate Gromer. And I, I just wanted to say that um, I know that Kate and Andy are listening in. I believe the McBrides are listening in uh, right now, too. So um, so a part of in telling the story is that there's so many beautiful, rich parts of the story that I think are best told by Kate and Andy and the McBrides and Connor. Um, and, uh, and I think Paul Tullis, actually, the author, uh, in the New York Times did a beautiful job of, of telling the story. And so for more of the, the sort of the backstory on the relationship between Anne and Connor and, and what went wrong there, and, um, and I would suggest reading the article uh, because I think it does a good job uh, of telling these, uh, these stories and how they all weave together. Uh, today we're going to be talking more about sort of for practitioners sort of points and uh, things that came up 
uh, in my conversations with Howard and also some conversations I had with Kay Pranis uh, during this during the process of doing this case. So I won't go too, too much into the details. I would uh, suggest listening um, or to reading the article, maybe watching the clip from the Today Show. I know there's going to be more uh, media appearances by the Gromeres and the McBrides in the future. Um, but uh, so, so just a little bit about the case. What was challenging for me from the perspective, there are a few things I want to share. Um, I think, well, another piece I just want to say that's a little challenging about talking about this from the perspective of a um, restorative justice facilitator is that, you know, secrecy and, you know, silence and, and confidentiality are everything when you hold this role. So it's been interesting for me to talk publicly about this case because I usually don't say anything about the cases that I work on, right? So obviously I do this with the permission and it's not the permission, the blessing of uh, the two families and Connor, uh, because in large part, their hope is that this story and this uh, will, and that Anne's life, the loss of Anne's life will be of some benefit for moving forgiveness forward and moving restorative justice forward. So these are, um, I just wanted to give that a little caveat. Um, we could have, again, another entire webinar about restorative justice in the media and what that looks like, that would be really helpful to me right now <laughs> in terms of thinking about how do we tell these stories in a way that advances the work um, and the limitations involved in working with media. Uh, not everyone is, is not every format is this webinar where we really get to think through things um, and have a dialogue with people who have questions as they're coming up. So, um, Okay, so all of that being said, so my initial instinct was to say no, and talking with Julie, you know, I agreed to have that phone number passed on to Kate and Andy, who called me instantly, and I had one of the most remarkable conversations I have ever had in my life with these two beautiful people, and by the end of that conversation, there was just no way that I could keep saying no. Um, I couldn't say it as flippantly as I said it to Howard. Uh, because I think by the time I'd spoken with, you know, both both Julie and, and, and Kate and Andy, I'd kind of fallen in love with everybody and, and couldn't keep saying this is impossible. So, um, so I guess the first thing that, that happened, and while Howard, you know, wanted to find a lawyer who could help think about what this could look like, um, I do believe that in the future, if we can find a way to sort of create a protocol for going into this, you don't need a lawyer to do this. We just needed a lawyer a little bit up front to think about um, sort of how to uh, facilitate it at this stage, at the, at the plea conferencing stage. Um, but ideally, I think lawyers will get a little bit more savvy to uh, how to engage uh, restorative practitioners at the plea conferencing stage. I think this is a model that can be replicated. Um, here's the complication here was that you're a prosecutor and never heard of restorative justice. And, right, yeah. exactly. And and the defense attorney, um, who I think the defense, it, so just a few things on the legal front. So um, early on, uh, after I had a few conversations, both with the McBrides and the Gromers, we had a conference call where they all got in the room together uh, with, um, uh, an, an, an advocate for their uh, work in this direction, Allison DeFore, as well as, um, I believe it was, yes, the defense attorney, uh, Greg Cummings, and we were all on this call together uh, trying to figure out how could we make this move, and I believe it was Allison's idea at that moment, uh, oh, what about the plea conference? Uh, that's a privilege and confidential dialogue that usually happens between the defense attorney and the prosecutor, and um, maybe we could use that as the format in which the restorative dialogue could occur. What if we brought everyone together for that uh, plea conference? And that's usually, you know, the two sides duking it out. Often the defendant isn't even involved in that dialogue. You know, uh, the defense attorney would go back after the conversation with the prosecutor and saying, hey, they're offering you 40. That's the best deal you're going to get. Take it or leave it. You know, that's kind of what that usually looks like. And so we were suggesting something very different <laughs> for what that negotiation process would look like. Um, we realized the big stumbling blocks at that point were going to be getting the prosecutor, Jack Campbell, on board, getting the jail on board for letting us do this in the jail, right? That's a real challenge. Um, some other things, and I'm thinking about sort of my lawyer hat in this work, and I think that many people come to restorative justice with another sort of background, be it social work, uh, psychotherapy, uh, whatever it is, there are ways in which we're trained in our profession, um, advocates. Uh, youth advocates, right, where we have to take those hats off in order to be this person who can hold the space in the middle. 
and uh, to attend to the victims, to uh, the folks who've done harm to the community uh, in equal proportion. And so as, as a former criminal defense lawyer, um, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm blessed because I come from victim's advocacy first, and yes, I was planning on being a prosecutor and then ended up being a defense attorney. So I feel like that sort of primed me to be able to do this kind of work. Uh, but, but I think that there are still challenges, and this is something that I spoke with at length uh, with Howard about through the, through the facilitation of this uh, prepping to, to come to the conference, was all the times in which it was very hard for me to take off my lawyer hat. Um, I'm thinking the McBrides and the Grimeras may be hearing this for the first time, but there were so many times when I had to just like uh, figure out a way to uh, turn off that, like, if this were to go to trial, wouldn't we file a motion to suppress about this or, you know, like, what, what kind of lawyer things I had to stop doing in order to just engage this. And at the same time, not turning it off so much that I would miss the opportunity to be a benefit to a restorative outcome because of my knowledge, right, as a lawyer. So, uh, well, originally, one of the things, I'm sorry, go ahead, Howard. At first, we thought you were just going to be doing the legal analysis, right? And that there would, I mean, the lead, helping through the legal process and somebody else would do the facilitation. That's right. It ended up that you did both. Right. And, and, and how that came about was that we did make some phone calls around Florida to say, who can do this case? And we, we talked with one practitioner actually in Tallahassee who turned it down who, uh, for really principled reasons. Um, but, um, and, and there were other people who I've actually heard from that said I, I'd heard from so-and-so that wanted me to do this and I turned the case down. Um, and I think it was because it was a challenge to do it in this plea context uh, rather than as a post, post adjudication thing. Um, and, and the other reason I didn't want to do it is because I was in Oakland and this was in Tallahassee and the clock for the trial had already started running, right? So this, there was a very short period of time. And it, so I was trained by Lorraine Amstead's assistant, right? In, in facilitating crimes of severe, dialogues and crimes of severe violence. And one of the things that I took away from that, one of the many wonderful things I took away from that training was slow down, don't rush to a dialogue. You were talking about horrible things that people are going to be grappling with. If it takes 18 months, if it takes two years, take your time. Well, we didn't have that kind of time. And that made me very nervous. But, um, and this is a part of where this forgiveness piece plays in. It was the Gromer's forgiveness, and uh, which I was also skeptical of in the beginning. I was like, that's pretty quick to forgive. And my own forgiveness journey took me six years, uh, ten, eight years. And so I was like, really? <laughs> you know, I have a child. Really? You've really forgiven already? <laughs> and what happens when you find out exactly how he took her life? What is the forgiveness going to look like then? You know, and I, I, so I had to think a lot about was it really emotionally safe or safe at all? I mean, I, I'm never worried about violence in this particular case occurring in the middle of the conference, but those are things we need to think very carefully about. And six months is short, is very short. And so the only, and I'm on the other side of the country, so I'm not having these dialogues face to face with folks. This is trusting a lot of what I can hear on the phone uh, with Connor too, all of them on the phone. So that was a little nerve wracking, um, but I just could tell the character of everyone involved in this process and the genuine desire to engage uh, in, in, uh, in this dialogue uh, with their eyes wide open. Um, and so it really was the sort of personal wisdom and character of everyone involved uh, that made it feel like this was something uh, safe to do. Um, and, uh, and, and it felt like it was. Howard, um, yeah, maybe what would be good is just to put up that first picture of the Gromers and the McBrides. Um, would be great to be able to see them, uh, the, the, the two sets of parents, um, if you can put that up. And um, so then, what um so uh, just quickly so other other sort of questions that came up for me as a lawyer that was challenging was sort of this question of connor had confessed right he walked one of the reasons why again another reason why it was we were able to do this in six months uh was that connor had confessed he had pretty much immediately driven himself to the um to the police station and, and given a full confession and in my initial conversations with Connor, it was pretty clear that he wasn't hiding anything. That being said, people have participatory traumatic stress. 
and often, and Connor couldn't remember some of the most, the, the, the moments leading up to the very last moments leading up to uh, taking Anne's life. Uh, were were fuzzy for him, or were sort of he remembers them and as, as if it's a cartoon, you know. And that's a pretty typical experience of people who've done something like this. Um, that you, the person who does it, who does the harm, also can experience traumatic stress from from being involved in this traumatic thing, uh, even if it was you caused the trauma. Um, and so I was really, um, I still had to think about: is this first degree murder? Is a second degree murder? Is something going to come out in the conference that makes it look like one way or another. Uh, and, and so we just needed to be very thoughtful about really was that pre-plea conference going to be an airtight space in which nothing that gets said there could be used against Connor. And it could have been used if, if the process broke down and we ended up back at, in a trial posture. It could be used to impeach Connor is what you know, we did our research, and, but it couldn't be used for any other reason. And I, I just didn't see Connor, and, and I talked this through with his defense attorney extensively, I didn't see Connor um, changing his testimony at the last minute in some way that would make me worry about that. Um, other things we had to think about was sort of the law. And one of the things that I'm, there's like three disappointments I have with the article. One is that it's conflated this restorative justice and forgiveness stuff, which we're going to talk about a little bit in a minute, um, or less the article and more the title, I think, of the article. Um, and the second thing is, that it sort of left out Howard is a big disappointment. Now, Howard doesn't care, but I do. <laughs> I care that it sort of leaves out the fact that Julie actually contacted Howard first, and when she was looking for a restorative justice expert, who she found was Howard, which is who she who she should have found. Um, and and my third disappointment is that it doesn't talk about some of the legal things that we were grappling with, such as Florida has a very strict law called 1020 life, which means if you have a gun in the commission of a felony. Uh, a forcible felony, that's a mandatory 10 year sentence. If you fire the gun, even in the air, there's a very, there's a big case in Florida right now about a woman who, a battered woman who fired the gun, she claims it was a warning shot and she's serving 20 years because she fired a gun in the committee. It's into the, it didn't, it didn't strike anybody uh, into a wall. It, it didn't strike anybody. And that's not to minimize the danger of firing guns, but rather it's a 20, just to understand it in the context of this case, 20 year mandatory minimum for firing a gun. Okay. And the, and the 1020 life, life is if you strike somebody, it's life. Uh, and if you kill somebody, it's mandatory life, but there's a chance to come down to 25 years if you strike somebody. But so that's the context within which we were looking at the law um, in Florida. And I think that that's very important to understand how courageous it was uh, for the prosecutor to engage in this dialogue with us and to come down to 20 years. Some people are saying, well, ah, it didn't, he didn't come down that far at all. He did, actually. Under Florida law, uh, this, was a, this was a significant departure. So um, one of the reasons we were able to do this again, and it comes out a little bit in the article, is because of broad discretion and understanding that while, of course, there's going to be huge political fallout if you go too far down, um, it, you know, that the prosecutor did have discretion here, and there was a possibility, particularly pre-charge and pre-plea, rather, um, to, to exercise that discretion, which is why I think this is such an exciting format for restorative justice, where victims are amenable to meeting this early in the process. Uh, this is a place in which victims can have some genuine sway on how things uh, go. So, um, you know, I think... Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about, too, the degree to which I did rely on Howard and, and also Kay Pran. It's one of the things that I, I found most useful uh, as a practitioner. Um, it was just my ability to touch base with people who were mentors to me and whose moral compass was very clear uh, and who were so deeply steeped in the principles of restorative justice. And so in taking these things on, uh, it, was, it was a very heavy case, and it was one that um, – was on my heart every day and still is. Um, I'm still in touch with Connor and the McBrides and the Gromares uh, on a regular basis. And um, but it was a very, it was a, it was, it was very. I couldn't have done it without, uh, without a team of people sort of helping me think through a lot of the questions. So, and and I think that the one piece that I would love to share that was so beautiful was at one point my lawyer friends were really chastising me for staying in the home of the um, Gourmets when I was uh, going down to facilitate the dialogue. And I, I, they kept telling me I had no boundaries. 
And so I called, I called Kay and I said, Kay, you know, I'm really getting a lot of flack from my, um, from my uh, colleagues, uh, my lawyer colleagues about my lack of boundaries and staying in the Gromir's home. Um, and I, and, and Kay said something so wise. She said, Sujata, which she often does, right? Uh, she said, Sujata, in restorative justice, we, we're not concerned with boundaries. We're, we're not trying to have strong boundaries. We're trying to have a strong center. And um, I, I remember feeling uh, that we very much created that strong center in the dialogue itself uh, in jail, uh, when we created that center that had all of these mementos of um, Anne's life and who she was and what was lost to the world when Anne was taken away. And um, in particular, there is a plaster cast of her hands uh, that was so beautiful. She had very long fingers. And, um, and that, was, that was just, it was, it was to have a, a piece of her beauty there. Um, and, and trophies and, and a portrait of her and, and many beautiful things were there in the center. Um, and, and I think that that's what we really, everyone in this process, including the prosecutor, the district attorney, um, everyone was very much able to drop their hats for those five hours uh, to the degree to which they were capable and um, really have the center be honoring the memory of Anne and thinking about what could be done moving forward to honor the memory of Anne. Um, Kate speaks so beautifully about how there's literally, it's, it's, this is an un, unpayable debt that Connor owes them, right? Uh, so forgiveness for them was, was letting that debt go with the understanding that there is no way to repay it. Um, but um, at the same time, there was an understanding that what this restorative dialogue was about was, was doing something uh, to do right by her memory for moving forward in a positive way. Um, and, and another part, I think the most moving part for me always was when Kate looked Connor right in the eyes and said that he had the works, the good works of two people to do now. Uh, that was his burden um, because Anne would have done wonderful things with her life. Um, so if you want to forward through the slides a little bit, um, um, Howard, here's a picture of uh, Anne and Connor together. Um, and I think what's so striking, you can do the next one as well. This is their prom picture. I think that what was so hard for me when I opened that New York Times article, um, I was so anxious about how you know we don't we don't get identity. <laughs> something that was probably frustrating for the McBrides and Connor and the Gromers and myself uh, was that you don't get to see what it's gonna say before they publish it, right? <laughs> so we don't get to correct stuff, which there would have been a few corrections. Not about the facts, more on the restorative justice side. Um, Paul did a great job of covering the facts, but. Um, <clears throat> um, and so I was really anxious to see what does it say, what's it going to say, what's it going to say. But what was interesting to me was I opened it, and if you want to go to the next slide, this is Connor today, just two years after. And if you can, I don't know if you can go backwards to see um, just how much two years in prison ages you. And so the last time I saw him, he looked like this. And I just opened that Times article and wept. Actually, it was really hard to see. I, I know that you know the McBrides and the Gromers see him uh, often. I know the Gromers visit him once a month, and the McBrides far more often than that, and talk to him every day. And um, so, for me to see, and I know that people change a lot between 19 and 22, and you know, but um, but that was just really a, a, a shock to me. That's uh, he, he was a very he's a very young he was a very young 19. Um, in a lot of ways, and, and extremely mature in other ways in terms of the capacity to take responsibility or this deep desire to uh, be introspective about the roots of his offending behavior. Uh, Connor's extremely um, mature in those regards, and in other ways, uh, very much a boy uh, when I met him. So that, that was a really, that was really tough and to see. And then if you want to do the next slide, this is like my favorite picture of all time. This is Andy at Anne's memorial service. And okay, to think that someone who just lost their daughter could have this look on their face, um, I think that that just kind of says it all about what an amazing man uh, Andy is and um, why I feel so honored to have him as a friend today. Um, 
I just I just love this this picture uh, so much. Um, it's actually and the picture of Anne too. It's a modification of a a picture uh, from the last birthday that she celebrated. Uh, it was it was, they did some sort of uh, photoshoppy something artisticy photoshoppy thing where they um, got rid of the really funny uh, hat that she, the, the the hat she was wearing um, in this picture of and it, and she just looks angelic. Um, and so I just I just this picture just says so much to me about who Andy is and his character and the way in which the Gromers have chosen to remember their daughter like this, that this is how they choose to remember their daughter. Um, and then I think the next one is just a picture of all of them uh, together. And, and really what this journey has been about um, has been trying to find uh, some uh, ways of moving forward now, given that Connor has 20 years. Another thing that I just want to bring up about the story too is that um and that was not in the article it's a hope really that connor will be so there's another situation in florida a remarkable situation in which a man took uh someone's life through drunk driving and the mother in that case t takes the car it's, it's like a crumpled like an accordion it's horrific and tows that car from high school to high school and the man who took her life would come in shackles and stand there in the parking lot with her and tell the story of uh, his drunk driving and um, taking, uh, taking, taking these girls' lives. And what, is, uh, remarkable, uh, what was remarkable to me uh, was that, that she would be willing to engage in this. And I, I don't know, and, and Kate could correct me, um, but I think she knows this woman, or uh, I can't remember if it's Julie or Kate, one of them knows this woman. Um, and, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm thinking that that's where the idea came from, that maybe the same thing could happen in this case, that maybe Connor could be released uh, in shackles, taken by the Department of Correction from time to time to high schools to speak about uh, teen dating violence, uh, to talk about violence prevention. Um, what a powerful thing uh, for him. And I, and I know that the Gromeros had wanted only 10 years, and I think there's a little confusion in the article, too, about exactly how much time that they wanted. Um, but as Kate recently said uh, on the Today Show, uh, they wanted 10 years inside and then 10 years of sort of, of a period where Connor was going to be repaying the harm that he did through his good acts. So that's uh, another piece that I think is just so astounding and so wise about what does it mean to try to fix what you've done. Um, uh, and I think that if Connor, sir, I, 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 you know, it says in the article too that I'm not worried about Connor getting out in 20 years. I'm not worried about Connor getting out in 10 years either. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any concerns about him doing future harm, given the amount of continued introspection he's engaging in about how he did this harm. I don't know, Howard, if you want to ask some of the questions that we talked about. Yeah, let's, or... let's move on to a couple of issues. And for those of you listening in, be sure to send questions if you have them. We have a few here, and we'll take a major amount of time for these questions after a bit, but uh, feel free to send in more. Uh, so, Jonathan, what about the, this forgiveness thing? I mean, we were both alarmed when we saw that topic. It's generated all kinds of responses to the New York Times. How, what, what does forgiveness have to do with restorative justice? How does it connect? What, the, what are the issues? Right. Um, so to my mind, uh, forgiveness is never a prerequisite for participation in a restorative process, nor is it an expected outcome of any restorative process ever, right? Victims identify their, in an ideal restorative process, victims are identifying their own needs and the process is one that is attending to those needs, right? Um, and, and outcomes will, will be attendant to those needs, right? Who's obligated to meet those needs? So a victim may or may not have a desire to forgive or, uh, a, um, or feel that they need to forgive, right? Um, that being said, okay, so in all the you know, uh, processes that I facilitate, sometimes the word forgiveness comes up, sometimes it doesn't. I'd say in 25% of cases, I'd say more than that, um, you feel that there's been some this is a complete forgiveness at the end. Um, maybe in 20, less than 25% of cases, there's this very transactional thing that happens sort of in lieu of court. You stole my car, you pay me back for the car, what, you know, whatever it is, is you burglarize my home, you tell me where the stuff is, we're gonna, we're all good in the end, right? It's not, it's not like everybody's best friends in the end. It's not like 
anyone and and people might still be angry like people might still at the walk away and still carry some i can't believe that kid did that to me i can't believe that happened you know um but i but i didn't want to go to court i don't i i i wanted to meet the person face to face and i wanted to ask them for what i needed um so forgiveness may or may not happen and then in 25 percent of cases maybe or more 50 percent is that what's left um something in the middle happens right uh so not required for participation, not a necessary outcome. That being said, I cannot imagine a better, you know, uh, cauldron for cooking up forgiveness than a restorative process, right? And I think we've talked about this, Howard. Some of the things that people often need for forgiveness are apology, uh, a genuine expression of remorse, and an effort to repair harm. Um, these things help people forgive. And uh, and so that, that happens, right? It's probably more likely to happen not probably, um, definitely more likely to happen than in court. You know, and I, one of the comments from the New York Times was a prosecutor saying, I've seen forgiveness twice. Well, yeah, because from the beginning of a criminal trial, you put one person on one side and this family is on the other side. And, and I've even seen it be sort of advantageous on the prosecutorial side to keep people as angry as possible, uh, especially in death penalty cases, so they can make a really compelling statement asking for death. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not thinking that that's an ideal scenario for cooking up forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this case, in this case, what's clear is that the forgiveness predated my even coming on the scene, right? The restorative dialogue didn't produce the forgiveness. If anything, I had some serious concerns that the Gromer's um, forgiveness would be tested by finding out all the facts, right? Um, and 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 Kate said, um, I don't remember if Kate or was Andy said afterwards. No, it was Kate. Uh, you know, I, I asked them. Uh, we had dinner together afterwards after the five-hour conference, and I said, well, now that you know everything, um, what you know, how do you feel about forgiveness now? And and Kate said, I'm going to have to think about it. And to me, that is that's real forgiveness, where you are actually assessing the entirety of what happened and looking it directly in the eye uh, at that point, then still saying, I release anger, resentment, uh, the right to retribution, the absolute right you would have to revenge, right? I relinquish those things. And they chose that after knowing everything that there is to know. Um, so, and that, but that, they'd already gone down that road before I, before restorative justice was a part of the picture. There's a, since there's, there's a question here that relates directly to this, I'll pick it up right now. It says, what is the definition of forgiveness? What is the relationship of restorative justice and reconciliation and resilience and the relationship of those three concepts of forgiveness? I'm glad you're answering that one. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my very, very wonky definition of forgiveness. There is um, there's a text called Forgiveness by a group of psychologists. Uh, the first one's name is Pargament, and they have a definition uh, forgiveness is a process, no, forgiveness is, I'm sorry, um, oh my goodness, uh, like it's totally skipping my mind, it's um, oh, intra-individual pro-social shift towards a perceived transgressor situated in a specific interpersonal context. Okay, now that's really wordy. And, no wonder you couldn't remember. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I, I see it a little differently. I see uh, forgiveness as an intra-individual, so personal to me. Uh, instead of pro-social shift, I think that's too vague. I, I see it as a relinquishment of anger, hatred, and the right to retribution and revenge, right? Towards a perceived transgressor. So, I mean, somebody, I think somebody harmed me, and so I'm angry at them, and I'm letting go of that anger. Whether or not they did or didn't harm me, I still may harbor anger towards them. And so that's, you know, um, that's why we have that word perceived in there. And then situated in a specific interpersonal context. You might forgive somebody for one act that they've done, but not for another act, right? So um, so I, I do like that for that that uh, that definition. Um, so what's its relationship to restorative justice? So And what's and what's the relationship to forgive to resilience and reconciliation there at? Okay, yeah. great. Gotta get them all. Check that this. Okay, next. It's, restore, it's relationship to restorative justice. I feel like we kind of just talked about that. So right. it, it, a restorative process is about harm, needs, and obligations, uh, victim-identified needs being attended to. Uh, forgiveness might be cooked up through a restorative process. Maybe not. I, I can't think of a better scenario for producing forgiveness than a restorative dialogue, um, but it's not expected. 
right? So that's its relationship to restorative justice. To reconciliation. Is that the next one, Howard? Yeah, rec reconciliation and resilience. Oh my goodness. Well, okay, so <laughs> from a, I'm going to punt to people who know far more than I do, like the Gromers, um, <laughs> on what that means in a Christian context. That's a whole gorgeous uh, dialogue that could be had on another day. Um, and I am, as a Buddhist, utterly <laughs> unqualified to answer. Um, I, I think that forgiveness and reconciliation are separate things sort of in their more secular terminology. I may choose to, and I have seen people choose to relinquish their anger towards someone, but still find it very unsafe, right? So the Dalai Lama is a perfect example of this. He has forgiven, uh, the, he forgives the actors in the Chinese government who continue to commit ongoing atrocities against his people, but he's not going back right now. He's not, you don't see him trying to move back to Tibet, right? Um, and that, when I think of reconciliation, um, that sort of the relationship is reconciled. Uh, the relationship is not reconciled between the Chinese government and the Tibetan government in exile or the Tibetan people, right? And though people may practice this individual personal relinquishing of anger, um, they, they choose to not carry that load. That doesn't mean that you, you know, you can forgive your abuser but not move back in with them kind of thing. So that's the way I see that sort of in the secular terminology. What was the last one, Howard? A resilience. <sighs> Okay, this is challenging. This is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't like for people to feel that if they, if forgiveness is, okay, so forgiveness is a very loaded term, and particularly in my mm -hmm. past work with, uh, uh, in, within the domestic violence community, I mean, people are like, yeah, you're still talking about the F word, you know, and I really yeah. appreciate yeah. that. And that there is so much pressure to forgive and that, um, and that it's often pressuring people prematurely or it may just not be a part of people's healing journey um, for them. This is this is challenging for me because that's not been my experience. My personal experience uh, was that I harbored a whole lot of anger and hatred uh, towards my father and which caused migraines and stomach problems. And so when I, I um, received some personal advice from the Dalai Lama about how to let go of that anger. What was interesting was the first question he asked me when I said, I want to forgive, um, you, you seem a lot happier and you're, and you're much more effective in working on behalf of abused and oppressed people without your anger. Uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to have that same thing because I feel like my anger is, has diminishing returns. And he, he asked me first, he said, have you been, are you, have you been angry long enough? Um, which I thought was an amazing question. Uh, and very challenging. And, and, and surveying anger's impact on my life, the answer was yes. And so then he gave me some very specific advice about forgiving, which I followed and was quickly able to forgive my father. And since then, have never felt any anger. It was interesting on the Today Show. Um, they asked Andy, but but you're still you're still angry, right? And he was like, uh, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, and I and people ask me, like, but you still must be angry. At your father. I'm like, no, I'm not. Actually, it's gone. Like the anger is gone. And with that, my migraines, my stomach problems, also all left me. And I see that with many, many people who've forgiven. Um, I also see some unbelievably resilient people who think that the word forgiveness is just about the most offensive thing they've ever heard. So I guess I don't want to. I don't want to have a. I don't want to come down on one side of that or the other. I think that. There are all kinds of ways to be resilient. I think forgiveness can be a tool in that toolbox. Um, and I think it's a personal journey. And at some point, if you assess inside yourself, uh, this anger does not serve me or the, the way I want to walk in the world, um, then maybe it's time to think about what kind of tools you can use to let go. We have a note here from uh, Gromers, and if, uh, if we get they, if they want me to read this, I'll be happy to do it. I don't want to do it without their permission. So let us know if you want us to read it. In the meantime, here's a related question. Do victims have to be amazing and groovy? Do they have to do they, for people to care about uh, the other's pain? Um, <laughs> can you can you repeat that? Do they have to be amazing well, and groovy? Do they have to care about people's pain? Absolutely well, not. It says I for have people to care about victims' pain, and I don't know if they mean victims or offenders, but do victims oh. have to be amazing and groovy for people to care about victims' pain? Is what oh, the question I oh no, ask. that's a great question. Absolutely okay. not. I work with victims all the time who I would not 
necessarily be friends with, and I care deeply about their pain. I do. And I, I think that it it was, um, I do spend quite a bit of time talking about how amazing the girl mayors were. It's just because I have literally, and the McBrides, and just love all these people to death. But, um, you know, where, where that's instrumental in this particular case is that if people were harboring dangerous levels of anger um, that was just like constant rage, I don't know if it would have been safe to do this in six months time, right? It's not, it, I think we have to be really thoughtful of, as practitioners about how quickly we bring people into the room together, okay? That's, that's where it's instructive for, um, for, for this work. Um, and, and I work with victims all the time who don't, uh, or not necessarily people I'd befriend, but it, wherever your heart is in terms of its openness to the people that you're working with, um, when maybe they're not being the easiest victims or the ways in which we want victims to behave a certain way, um, because it's easier for us, you know, if you find yourself having categories of victims, this might not be the right work for you, you know, and I know for myself personally, I don't have that problem, um, especially when people are um, inventorying the ways in which they were harmed for me. I, I just, I, my heart feels open under those circumstances. Um, and, and, and I feel really strongly that people deserve justice uh, as they define it. So it doesn't really matter if I like them or I don't like them. I mean, I, and I kind of end up liking everybody because they're being forthright, right? Like they're being, they're being very powerful and forthright in their journey to get what they need. Well, co-mayors have given permission to read what they wrote. It's too bad we don't have them wired up to be on here today, uh, but it's too late, it's unfortunately, to do that. But they said that Christian forgiveness does not require reconciliation. It would be the ultimate goal, but it requires both, both parties to participate. The offender must repent and work to not harm the other person. This isn't possible in every case. So thank you for that. There is a question here that got a, more, a larger uh, system that seems to fit in here. So I will read that for you. How can, and I, I'm sorry to have to look to the side. We, I don't have my, another computer here where I'm being fed, fed these questions. How can we get from a fender focused restorative justice dialogue to a victim led and victim focused restorative justice practice? And how can restorative justice get from system focus to people focus? My own healing with the man who murdered my dad came from him contacting me out of the blue 30 years ago after that savage day. And those in charge of restorative justice in Canada were not happy about this because we did not fill out the right forms and get their permission. Forgiveness seems to be the way to grab people. That is really not the truth. This is my experience as well. Hmm. So from victim, the beginning from, part, Howard, from from, from, from offender, offender focused to victim led and victim focused restorative justice practice, and from system focused to people focused restorative justice practice. Wonderful question. Okay, so the first part, moving to victim, um, victim centered or, or victim led. Um, I just think that. To me, it's about returning to the principles of restorative justice. I don't think we're doing restorative justice unless it is victim-oriented work. Um, I'm really, really blessed to have uh, received our, uh, the uh, National Council on Crime and Delinquency, where I work. We have a restorative justice project, and we received um, a grant from the Office of Victims of Crime, uh, which is a part of the Department of Justice, um, to survey the nation for 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 these types of things, let's let's figure out who's doing what out there. Um, and I'm particularly interested in learning about um, the degree to which folks are actually victim oriented. Um, how do we get people to make that shift? To me, there is a real somehow we just wandered away from. Uh, I think what Howard just so beautifully phrases the three questions. You know, what harm was done you know, what needs have arisen and whose obligation is it to meet those needs? If we don't, if we ask those questions, how are we doing this without victims at the center? Like, I don't understand how restorative justice operates without victim identified needs being the centerpiece of the process, right? Um, so, so for me, it's just sort of reinvigorating what restorative justice was about in the first place. Um, and um, I think, I think in some ways, um, 
I think working with folks who have harmed is just easier in some ways, especially when they're captive audiences in prison. And I don't mean mm -hmm. to dismiss in any way the wonderful work that happens inside prison. I myself go inside often to groups like uh, the Victim Offender Education Group or to the Resolve to Stop the Violence program here in California and tell my story of being sexually abused to the guys who are inside. But it's their restorative justice program, right? It's not they're not being held directly accountable to my needs as their victim. I'm, they're, I'm not their victim, right? So, um, so I don't want to dismiss that work. I engage in that work. I love it. Um, but I think that restorative justice has been come to, has people have come to see it as that, like groups inside prisons, et cetera. Um, and and I just I, I think that we I want to help pull us back towards being creative about actually engaging victims uh, in processes as early as possible, and to have um, people be attendant to those needs. Moving from state-centered to people-centered, that's interesting. I don't think we have, that may be a more of a Canadian problem than a U.S. problem. Maybe, Howard, you can speak to that a little bit. I don't feel like we have our systems, we, we don't have very many systematized restorative justice programs. If anything, I was just meeting with some prosecu a prosecutor here last night who was saying, how do we embed this? That it's a, it's a regular process, that it's a mechanism that things are diverted to restorative processes. And, and my concern is always with, well, if we do that, then how are we attending the victim's needs? Um, but yeah, I, mean, I don't know, Howard, if you have some thoughts on that one. No, nothing beyond what you've said. We've got more questions around the forgiveness, but we've got some specifically around some of the legal issues. I want to come to those and then come back to the other ones. One of the questions says, it seems like the prosecutor took a real chance in participating in this. Do you know what kind of repercussions he has experienced? Do you think he would do it again? Oh, I think, I don't know if he'd do it again. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to ask Jack that. Um, I, I, it was a big risk. Um, Every prosecutor who does this takes a big risk. Again, the prosecutor I was with last night, Matt Gold, he used to head the juvenile division uh, here, and he just wrote a beautiful blog that's up on our website, uh, nccdglobal.org. You can you can see it's called the Healthy Skeptic. It's a great blog, and it is it. He doesn't talk about the political risks because Matt. I don't know what it is with Matt, but he he just sees something good and 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 he's gonna what he perceives as good, and he's gonna do that. He's not he's not the most a politically cautious prosecutor out there, which is great. <laughs> Versus, I think, uh, the prosecutor in this case is more politically cautious. Um, I he believe did. that he took that risk because the Gromers went to him personally. It wasn't my advocacy at all that made this happen. He, he um, did test it with other people in the community. He did. Which I, which I thought was a very positive thing. He, he, Absolutely. And yeah. one other, there are many things that are missing from the article just because an article in the New York Times this is why the Gromers uh, need to write a book someday uh, about this whole thing. Um, but they got a thousand signatures, a thousand wow. signatures before we even got started. There was a thousand, the Gromers and the McBrides, I believe, collectively got That's a thousand signatures, that. including domestic violence organizations including domestic violence organizations. So that is so critical in the in the community piece of this particular case. Thousand names uh, saying that they wanted the Gromers to have the option to do restorative justice, right? This is something victims were asking for. A thousand people, including domestic violence organizations, were in support of that. So here's another question. One impediment I've been thinking about after hearing about this experience is how often the courts I work in institute no contact orders in violent felonies. Any thoughts or suggestions of how to address the predisposition in the system that is to keep people separated? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is some of the stuff that I think, I, so um, ideally we're going to, you know, something Howard has had in mind for a while and he and I have been talking about and others too is uh, this restorative lawyering uh, sort of as a sort of niche inside of restorative justice where we help create the legal mechanisms that allow these sorts of problems to be avoided, right? Right now, there, is an, um, there was an amazing dialogue that happened uh, here in California between a man who has a permanent severe uh, head injury um, and, the, and the young man who did this to him, um, kicked him in the head while robbing him. And they have become the best of friends, literally the best of friends. And they want to tour together and uh, dialogue uh, with the country, you know, about, about their remarkable friendship. And, but they're prevented because of the terms of his parole. Yeah. And, 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 you know, they, it just got caught that it was not in his parole terms that he's not, and they changed the terms of his parole 
after they found out that these guys have been in contact saying, you guys can't do that. And, and, the, and, and so the victim went down and signed something saying, I will not sue you if anything, and they still, they're not, you know, so we're trying to, when victims want to go speak in public with the people who have harmed them about, you know, I just, you know, so we need to create legal mechanisms. And I feel like we need sort of a space inside either the current way the victims movement rights movement is, is, is constructed or, or an alternative victims rights movement yeah. um, to, uh, to, to make space for these kinds of needs and desires and wishes that victims have. Um, but um, these are the challenges that we are seeing. And I think it's jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It's, it's can, can we get a waiver in this particular case? Can we have this district attorney agree to it? These are the kinds of things that we're really struggling with right now. Can I just co-facilitate the case this fall with a sex offending, a, sex, a registered sex offender who was on, on parole and a young woman he had, he had violated and wanted to meet with him. And we had to go all the way to the state Supreme Court to get permission yep. for that to happen. Um, this is the kind of like specific legislation that might be helpful. If we yeah. tailor, I'm generally very nervous about RJ legislation. I think that it often I'm creates too. more problems and more limitations. But if you can have something very specific, right? Like victims who want to meet for here in California, it would be great. Victims who want to meet with the person on death row who took their loved one's life, uh, that nothing in those processes can be used in future appellate process. That, yeah. But that'll stop defense lawyers from preventing victims from talking with their clients, right? These are the kinds of things where we are yeah. making space for victims to get their needs met. Here's an encouraging note. I am a prosecutor who has been tasked with implementing restorative justice in the court. I am posted in at the pretrial stage. Yay! Yeah, <laughs> cool. What? Another legal question while we're at it. Uh, Make sure domestic, you get their get their jurisdiction so we can talk to them later, Howard. <laughs> yeah, okay, they can send that in here if they want. Um, in domestic abuse cases, sometimes a victim retracts an accusation and claims to forgive the perpetrator at a time when family members and prosecutors want to move forward with legal charges. How does this, how does this dynamic complicate the timing and rationale for restorative justice work? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that I, I can't speak too much to this um, because this is not my area of expertise. Like people often talked about how it wasn't safe to do this case because it was a domestic violence case. I just want to be clear that this wasn't uh, in that posture, right? I mean, Anne is gone. It wasn't about a, an ongoing manipulative relationship, uh, or that sort of thing uh, in this case. So I think it is important to, to show that this isn't that kind of domestic violence case. That being said, I think it can be done. Uh, in Nogales, Arizona, there is a, a robust program there. I think it's still in existence. Uh, Howard, I don't know if you have any more updates on I'm what's going on with the Circulos de Paz, right? But um, that's, that's happening in Arizona. Um, and, and, and what's really, really important um, in doing domestic violence cases uh, through restorative uh, pro justice process is that people be cross-trained. So you need to both be knowing a whole lot about, you know, the cycles of violence that happen in domestic violence cases and, and, and know to see the signs of manipulation, et cetera, et cetera, in DV, um, and, and also be really skilled in yeah. facilitating crimes of severe violence. So that's, you know, and the same with hate crimes, anywhere where there's a power differential uh, between the person who's harmed and the person who's been harmed, um, I, want, I want to see people cross-trained in those two, two types of things. Here's another encouraging note regarding the examples of the state process, which may apply to things restorative since the mid 90s, New Zealand legislation has required that every matter before the courts and parole boards be tested for a restorative opportunity. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, uh, I wonder what it would be like if we had that here. <laughs> I wonder too. I wonder too. Um, here's a question. Given the unique circumstances of this case, do you see it, that is, restorative justice at pre plea stage or pre adjudication stages in crimes of severe violence as a special ex exception to the application of restorative justice or a potential new avenue worth pursuing? The latter. <laughs> yeah, I know you do because. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what you're doing there in, in the Bay Area. Yeah, you bet. So um, in 2008, I got a Soros Justice Fellowship to uh, help spearhead a restorative juvenile diversion program. Um, and and one, of its, one of its hopes was that, you know, we don't have a diversion that is, uh, you know, really robust for more serious crimes. And the idea was really inspired by what we learned of particularly the Maori uh, discontent in New Zealand with the disproportionate lockup of their children as compared to the white population there. 
we have that problem in Oakland. And so what would it look like to develop a, a restorative juvenile diversion program that was available for burglaries, carjackings, arsons, teen dating violence, um, um, robberies, uh, serious assaults, the kinds of stuff that fills our juvenile hall uh, with young kids of color. And so, um, and so what, what the hope was was to create a program uh, that would be able to do this pre charge pre pre charge right so these children are picked up for crimes but then rather than going through the traditional process they have an option up front to go through a restorative juvenile diversion program and so it's um since taken off and uh i am no longer running that um an organization called community works uh is holding that work now and doing a great job and they have a federal grant uh, to keep 100 kids a year out of the juvenile justice system, and they're doing a great job. Uh, they've done 60 cases so far, and uh, or more than that now at this point, I think. And they they're just it's it's going really, really, really well. So my belief is definitely serious assaults. Um, you know, a car theft. Um, we did a hate crime a few months ago with a mosque and a bunch of kids who threw lemons and rocks while they were praying during Ramadan. 40 people in this conference. It was a Astounding, amazing, um, and you know, uh, so definitely, I believe in it in that context. I I believe that we can do it in this plea posture as well. We need folks who are working with either lawyers themselves or working closely with lawyers who are going to understand the potential legal snafus, um, especially if we're doing with a homicide case, especially if it's a first degree homicide case. Um, you don't want to get in that circle and then have not have understood the legal consequences if the thing falls apart because we are talking about heavy 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 stuff coming out and so I, I want us to be super thoughtful about um, not putting victims in a position that they can't back out da, 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 without it having some legal consequences etc right so um, it, it for me restorative justice always has to be voluntary on all sides and I just want us to be super thoughtful about moving forward in ways that allows that to be the case Here's another uh, encouraging note. I am a I am in Cape Town, South Africa, and the prosecutor and I am the prosecutor has been tasked with implementing restorative processes. So here we are again. <laughs> uh, we're getting lots of questions now, so we'll keep working here. I don't know if we'll get to all. Uh, does the restorative process normally have to originate with victims? And more pointedly, is it inappropriate to seek out victims for this possibility? And, you understand the question? Yeah. Uh, so if it becomes systematized, it's never initiated by the victim, right? What what's usually what's happening in this pre-adjudication context, uh, et cetera, is that like I'm getting we get cases from the district attorney uh, for the kid that got picked up. So then we have to go reach out to the victim and say, do you want to do this? Um, and so again, I you know I've had a lot of training in victim services. I just feel like it's really, and I think that people, and I think that a good restorative justice training will really train you well into not trying to talk victims into doing anything. You may be this believer in your process. We were talking about this last night with a group of practitioners, um, and it was it was really interesting. You know, this being even though you believe that restorative justice is the best thing ever, you really can't try to talk people into it. Um, in my dream world, you know, there would be more victim initiated opportunities. It's something I hear about sometimes from the folks who do the defense initiated victim outreach stuff in capital crimes is that they used to call it defense initiated victim outreach Devo, but now sometimes they're thinking they have to call it veto, right? Because they're hearing from so many victims that they want some contact with the defense, um, with the with the defendant. Yeah. And so, you know, it's interesting. Um, in crimes of severe violence post adjudication, it's the, the two models I'm most familiar with, Florida and, I mean, um, Texas and Pennsylvania, it's always victim initiated, right? So, um, and there are most places, the defendant in cases where the person serving time is pre prevented by law from reaching out to their victims, right? You can't, you, there's no contact, you can't write to anybody, you can't try to initiate this. Um, in my dream world, we would have sort of a neutral place for victims advocates that's sort of outside both the prosecutorial world and the yeah. defense world. Uh, that, that victims advocates would be community-based folks who are um, sort of recognized by the state uh, as having the uh, the capacity to to reach out in either direction, depending on which way it was initiated, but to do so in a way that is wildly respectful of victims who want you to go away. <laughs> they want you to go away, right? Like you just, you just have to totally respect that 
And that is a part of why this whole like forgiveness mantle thing is just too high. It's, or it's just a too high of a standard. You know, if you're walking in thinking that everybody's going to love and hug each other at the end, it was amazing in get this case that it happened, right? It's gorgeous when it happens, of course. Um, it, it makes us all feel good, you know, but, um, but that's, that uh, restorative justice is also about the stuff that feels really, really bad. And if we don't make space for both, then we're not really doing, we're not, we're, we're putting victims in a box. Um, and, and one of the things is, is, is not having any uh, negative feelings when the victim is like, I don't want to talk to you. You know, like, yeah. I respect that. If you ever want to talk to me, here's my info. Yeah. Have a great life. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we often say that restorative justice is needs-based. Here's a question. If the victims uh, uh, had already forgiven, what was their motivation for restorative justice? What were their needs? And were the parents of the perpetrator also victims? And should their needs be a key focus in restorative justice? Oh, my goodness. Thank you for asking that question. We talk about that all the time with the McBrides. <laughs> Such a great question. I thought yes. you'd like that one. Yes, I do. Parents are so deeply impacted by the things that their children do. Both, you know, in the article, uh, you see so beautifully the way Michael takes responsibility in part for sort of his um, sort of his anger issues and how they they taught Connor anger, basically what he said, you know. And so, but I think that we like to just stop there and say, parents screwed the kid up and it's their fault, and and and, and you know, people really become pariahs when their children are incarcerated. Um, and are forgotten. And so parents absolutely have needs. In our restorative justice process here, and, and what we did with Connor as well, um, you know, the plan to repair the harm has four parts. Do right by your victim, uh, do right by your community, do right by your parents, if you have parents, right, your guardians, whoever's taking care of you, and do right by yourself. And so I think that that's a critical piece of the process. That's one um, piece to answer. And what did the Gromers want? Um, you know, I think that what they wanted was not a trial. Um, a trial would have been awful in this case. I, I hated defending cases like this in part because um, it just polarizes and polarizes people and it has makes these false good guys, you know, trying to find fault in the victim. Um, it, it's just a part of defending a case like this. Oh, just the thought of anyone doing that to Anne's memory is disgusting. Um, and, and, and what happens and what necessarily happens, uh, and you can't blame defense attorneys for doing that because that's what they have to do, uh, but um, a lot of the time. So, so that's a part of it. Avoiding trial was huge. Um, and then another piece is really crafting an outcome that would heal the, the situation as much as possible. Again, uh, the grammars are very clear. This is a debt that can never be repaid, and that forgiveness was necessary for that piece. Anne is never coming back, right? So that we're not trying to fix that through restorative dialogue. But what does Connor need to do to move forward in a positive way was a part of what they needed to see happen. Also, and, and uh, Howard, you speak about this so beautifully. You know, victims. There, there are certain questions that will never come out in a trial, right? And victims have needs to know what happened. Uh, and Kate didn't have that need, but Andy did. Um, and, um, and so then I had asked Kate, you know, what do you want to not know so that we should pause so that you can leave the room and then Andy can ask what he wants to ask and then you know, we can bring you back. She's like, it's not that I didn't want to know, it's that I didn't need to know, right? Um, and, but, but Andy did have some things he needed to know. Um, and, and, and for me, what, what I see now today, too, is that they can be sure that their forgiveness is complete because they heard it all. Um, and, and I think answers to questions really is the one thing that a traditional criminal justice system rarely gives us. Uh, I just remember one of the first times, the first time I met you, Howard, you know, you said people want to know, like, what were my child's last words or what was my son doing on that bridge that night? Was he dealing drugs? Or like all these, you have this string of questions that all these different parents and people, whatever, have about about what happened. We really need to, as you say, restory our lives and we need to understand what happened uh, in order to, to move forward a lot of the time. So I think that's, that's a piece of what they got out of it. And also being able to, they helped come up with the terms of probation, uh, of, of, of this term of probation. You know, how empowering is that for victims to say, I want this and this and this and this and this to happen and for that to be a part of what is decided occurs. Um, yeah. 
there, there are questions coming in about media we want to get to and a little bit about resources. So I'm going to try to watch that here. We have about 10 minutes before we need to start winding down. But there's a couple questions we might be able to answer fairly quickly. And that is, what do you do when it becomes clear to you as facilitator that the victim offender distinction isn't as clear as maybe the case claimed it was? You know, that's, that's not the way they phrase it, but what yeah. do you do when it wasn't that clear there's not a single wrong here? Well, let's be super clear that that was not the fact in this case, <laughs> right? right. Um, Connor had struck Anne a couple times before this happened, and he shot her. And 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 any victim blaming that happened in any of the comments in the New York Times or otherwise or that I've heard nonsense. I just want to be super clear um, that 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 it's never never anyone's fault. When, when this sort of thing at all. And that's just not something we engage in and not something we engaged in in this. Um, so um, in this case, so that being said, there are cases where, you know, and this is where it makes me really nervous when I get a case from the, from where, you know, I, I had six kids being listed as the defendants in a case, right? And then I get to like page six of the police report and it's the same six kids are the victims. <laughs> And it was just obviously it was like a brawl, right? Like they, everybody was just beating everybody up and we don't know what's what. And my personal tendency in those circumstances is to use circle process instead of restorative mm -hmm. community conferencing or family group conferencing. Um, because with, with, with family group conferencing, which is the model we use here, restorative community conferencing, uh, Connor's in the hot seat to be held responsible for the unequivocal harm he has done. Uh, and it's not, it, we're not trying to, um, collectively come up with who all is responsible to what degree. I think that circle process works better when there's confusion. I also, this is why I don't like the victim's veto on whether or not cases can move forward because it puts the power in the hands of the state to decide who the victim was. And sometimes that plays itself out in mutual assault cases along race lines. And that makes me extremely uncomfortable. When I get in the room with the two kids and one is one color and one's another, you can imagine which direction who has been deemed victim. Um, it, it looks on the police report when it might not actually be that way, and a restorative process is still an excellent thing to do under those circumstances. I'm going to go to some media questions. Uh, we have more time. I'll come back. But um, what, what, were the, what were the conversations with the media like? Seems like there's a steep, steep learning curve there on what restorative justice is. Do you think the appearances the family have made helped with that learning curve? What's worked well and what doesn't, what hasn't worked so well? And what you have had lots and lots of media responses. Let me try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Just today, even you know, it's uh, um, yeah, which I'll call you about later, Kate, and, then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and the Gromers. I mean, and the McBride. So, um, yeah. So, um, what I think what is challenging about media and restorative justice generally is that every time there's a case, that case becomes what restorative justice is. Mm -hmm. And here, forgiveness existed. And so forgiveness has become restorative justice. And in the next case, it'll be hate crimes. And then it'll be restorative justices for hate crimes, right? It's always going to be limited to the specific case because it looks different in every case. And people have trouble differentiating between the facts of this particular case and what is restorative justice more broadly. So that's always going to be a challenge every time we decide to have media involved, right? Um, and, you know, you do your best and you choose your venues wisely. We, uh, and I, I follow the Gromer's wishes on everything on this. So if they don't want to go on Inside Edition or 48 Hours, we're not doing it, right? But mm -hmm. if, they wanna, if they want to, then we will. Um, but I'm very lucky that they're not picking any venues that I worry about being really, really um, not thoughtful venues, right? Because they want to honor the memory of Anne, and so they have a good sense of what's a thoughtful and what's not a thoughtful venue. So that's that's one of the things. And then just understanding that it's going to be time limited and space limited. And what my, my boss, Alex Buzanski, who's the president of NCCD, just said last night, which was really helpful, was, so if there's bad press, then you have an opportunity to uh, correct it, you know? And, and especially like when there's shows that are going to be about forgiveness instead of restorative justice, and they want me to come in and just talk for a second about restorative justice and the forgiveness stuff. Um, and that is going to create more confusion, but hopefully there's an opportunity for clarifying that confusion. And I think we're reaching the point now, especially in this OVC grant, we have 900 organizations in our database for this thing right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's happening. Like restorative justice is happening. So we have to 
it's good to get it out there. And we just have to be super thoughtful about how we do that. And, and when the media misrepresents us, just try to correct it, you know, um, and, and, and use it as a learning opportunity. Well, related to that, the question is that it seems the media exposure is so often related to this forgiveness thing. Uh, do you feel this does hinder the overall acceptance and understanding of restorative justice? And what can we as practitioners do to uh, continue to relay the message forgiveness is not required for restorative justice processes? Yeah, just keep saying it. I think we just need to keep saying it. I do think that the media is more interested in forgiveness than restorative justice. And, you know, maybe that's a door into us talking about restorative justice more. Um, I, I struggled with this a lot, you know, um, and, 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 and it's a particular challenge for me because I so honor the Gromers and their journey. Um, and th this is their story. And every time you're telling a restorative justice story, right, as, as a facilitator who's been um, given the honor of still continuing to be a part of the storytelling around this, I am telling their story. And their story involves forgiveness. So it's not getting sidelined. That's just not going to, that, that, that's a part of what happened in this case. Um, but I do, I do, I mean, and, and this is something that we've talked about, I've talked with the Gromers about at length, that I continue to say, restorative justice is not required, it does not require forgiveness mm -hmm. and for participation or as an outcome. And I'm going to, that's like the sound bite that I try to get in on every, I try to get in on the Today Show. They cut I know, it. but they didn't yeah. cut it. That's what happens. They cut it. I try. I just try. <laughs> keep trying. And, and, and at the same time, it's because I can't, it's not just the media, but my phone is ringing off the hook about defense attorneys calling from all across the prosecutors calling. And I mean, prosecutors, it, it yeah. has done, I feel like it's done more good than harm. Um, and I, personally don't have a problem with people also thinking about forgiveness. You know, it's not no. like we're thinking about something really terrible in addition to thinking about restorative justice. So, Well, I know I've become pretty cynical over the years with all the media, but I think one of the things we decisions we made early on is to try to avoid uh, media that was primarily entertainment focused. Uh, that is another hard and fast rule, but that's one. Um, Rosemary's, Rosemary sent a note that I believe they intend for me to read. They we, probably believed, do. we believed in Connor's redemption. We wanted to provide an opportunity for Connor to redeem himself. Originally, we were pursuing having Connor placed in a faith-based prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so thank you for that. <laughs> As we unfortunately have to start wrapping up here, I'm trying to see if there's any, there are people asking about resources uh, in bibliography. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, one thing, on the field generally, the little book series, there's a book, one on victim offender dialogue, including severe crime. There's one on family group conferencing, New Zealand style, which you use to craft your program. There's of course a little book of restorative justice. What other reading or uh, resources would you suggest? That's a great question. I mean, yeah, basically everything Howard's ever written. <laughs> Um, so my latest I, is one book is on pickup trucks, so you probably don't want that one. No, people should read that one too. Yeah. Read the book on pickup trucks. <laughs> and um, yeah, a little book of, of uh, you know, and, and, and just doing multiple trainings. I think if you want to do this work, I'm so blessed to have been trained by Kelly uh, Branham in Devo, trained by Lorraine um, in, 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 vic in uh, Victim of Federal Dialogue and Crimes of Severe Violence, trained by Jessalyn Nash in... Uh, family group conferencing and so it was all of this together that helped me in addition to you know sort of my legal training uh craft these kinds of things and so for me just being a lifelong learner uh is really important not just in the reading because the theory is very nice um but the practice what i love about howard we just said a couple minutes ago i just facilitated this he's still facilitating cases right so keeping your practice alive and being trained to do this kind of practice is really really critical Here's a question that might be a good one as we start to wrap down, although it's not an easy one. What resources are available for people who would like to create community if they are not actually related to the offender or victim? I mean, how can we create some kind of avenue to change our community outside of just making sense? Oops, it just jumped here. Where am I? Outside, uh, how can we create some kind of avenue to change our community outside of just making sense of things? that have happened to our own families. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just think circle process and community is the most important thing ever for that. Um, so, you know, we, we 
I, I just, I love Circle. I use uh, family group conferencing slash restorative community conferencing uh, for these kinds of serious crimes. But as a bedrock practice for developing restorativeness in community, I think Circle process is it. And a K Pranis training is like the gold standard <laughs> for me in how to really learn um, how to do this. And just to have community being built through Circle process, that way of equalizing each voice in the circle, and to pick different topics that are of value, right? That that might that might be useful in your community. But we held circles in Oakland after um, Oscar Grant was murdered here, um, and uh, you know we we have these healing circles in schools um, when when we have an incredibly high youth homicide rate here in Oakland, and we have healing circles in the schools and. And, and but you can do them for anything. And I literally, I used to use Circle when my son was three and he didn't, you know, he just wanted to like help him sort out his stuff with his friends. We put a bunch of three-year-olds in Circle together. So for me, getting a Circle training and starting to just apply Circle in your life, in your neighborhood, in your community. If you want to start a community garden, think about using Circle as a way to start that dialogue um, and invite people to Circle and always have food, always have food. <laughs> Here's, this, this is the last question, but I'm not sure you can answer it in four minutes. Uh, what, which voice, victim's voice matters? There are many victims when a crime happens, and one of them may want to restore to justice or healing. Others may say, no way. Is there anything you could say in three or four minutes on that one? No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like that's, that's a, I'm so blessed that we have not had that challenge. We've certainly done cases here where there's multiple, um, multiple people who've been harmed and uh, gratefully all have been either in favor of participating directly or we're just happy to have the other victims stand in for them and, and allow them to sort of be their surrogates. Um, gosh, Howard, I don't know, what do you say under those circumstances? I've just not, I've not been challenged by that. Where one person saying, I want this young person to get the criminal justice, juvenile justice process, and the other one saying, I want to have face-to-face -face dialogue where we come up with the outcome instead. I just, I've literally never had that happen. So I don't, I don't really talk about that. I think it, I mean, remember that this is a needs based process. And so trying to help everybody involved understand what their needs are and what will meet their needs helps that process. You know, to my experience, that you can get to some kind of solutions that will meet everybody's needs. But I think we better move on here. I'm, I'm sorry to end it. There's, there's questions coming in. There's still good questions. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over here now to Jen Bricker to wrap this up. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, there is a national conference on restorative justice coming up in June in Ohio. It's not, uh, now I think our field is, has a pretty weak infrastructure right now. And so our, our conferences are not getting everybody, but that would be one place where people could gather if they wanted to. Um, we're looking at some online courses and things like that. We're be glad to hear from you if you think those kinds of things would be useful. But I'm going well, to also just yeah. to mention the thing at pay, uh, at uh, Campbell University. Actually, the Gromares, the McBride, oh, yeah. and you and me will all be on a stage together shortly, as well. Oh, I forget the, the date of that. It's the middle of March. I think it's the 14th and 15th of March. I don't know if there's a link for it yet or not. But yeah, it'll be the first time we're all together. I'm looking Yay. forward to it. <laughs> all right, Jen, you want to come in here and wrap it up for us? Tell us yeah. what's happening next. In terms of ongoing educational opportunities, we have a few to tell you about. There's a webinar coming up again on February 27th. This will be the promise and challenge of restorative justice practices in schools. It's gonna look at different school applications that are happening around the country. What are the potential benefits? What are the barriers and challenges to implanting restorative justice practices? What works and what does not? Again, that'll be on a Wednesday. It'll be the same time, 4.30 to 6.30 Eastern Standard Time in the US. And there's a link right there. You can click that link to register for that. We also have an online course that's gonna be available this coming spring, starting on February 21st. It'll be six weeks long. It'll be on Thursdays from 4.30 to 6.30. That's Justice in Transition, Restorative and Indigenous Approaches in Post-War Context. That'll be a time to look at the intersection of transitional justice and restorative justice and see some examples happening around the world. You can click on the link there to get more information on that. Oh, and I see, I think that perhaps Brian's click adding the links to those two things down there if you can't click through the, the slide. There will also be additional webinars coming. Stay tuned for those. And you can learn more about other EMU programs on emu.edu. 
There is an undergraduate program with peace building and development, some graduate programs. I'm a master's student here in conflict transformation, can focus on restorative justice. There's the Eastern Mennonite Seminary, the Summer Peace Building Institute that allows you to come for one week at a time during the summer, and STAR, which is the Trauma Resilience uh, Institute that we have here on campus. Back to you, Howard. So thank you all. Maybe I'm not, thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have feedback for us, let us know. If you have suggestions for future webinars that you'd like uh, to see us consider, uh, send those to us. And we do continue, we will plan to continue this series throughout this winter and, and, uh, and spring and maybe beyond that. So keep in touch. Thank you so much and have a good evening or depending where you are, morning. Thank you and goodbye.